All right, let's do history. Today is her story. You know my sin. Up for a feature in the sedition. This is where we tell the story of our greats. This is where we tell the story of our heroes and heroines. This is where we tell stories to inspire the younger generation. This is where we bring bear to footprints for the younger generation to walk in. This is where we explore blueprints. It takes the smarts to decode siphon from the story. So listen with rapt attention. Don't just pay attention listening to the story and the out, sweet out. No, no, no. Pay attention to details. Read between the lines. Sometimes I take some time to exploit the story myself, punch holes into the story, highlight certain points or certain moral lessons out of the story. Sometimes I don't when I'm in a rush because of time. When I don't do it, I implore you to do it. Read between the lines when I tell you stories of great people. They are moral lessons. They are lessons, greater lessons for you to pick up or learn. I just don't tell you the stories for the fun of them, but for a purpose. 35 after 7. Good morning one more time. Baba is an Uber driver. When I say no, I mean bold driver. A very good version. He used to work at the as if Women's Bank, African Bank, African Bank, yeah? That bank has gone down too. A very conscious man. Baba, wherever you are, yes, I pick up your signal. You're listening to the show in your car with your passenger. Good morning to you. Bless the love, Baba. Enough love, my brother. Baba is a Kwesimian team Zongo born virgin. Even though he has moved out of Kwesimian team Zongo, but that's where his umbilical cord is. So big up Kwesimian team Zongo, big up Kwesimian team, the entire Kwesimian team, let's say love. Enough love, Rastafari. Love. Baba will be getting married on the 20th of August. That's this month, 20th of this month. At the second day, Zongo, I will be there. He's a good virgin. So second day, Zongo will have me, or will be hosting me on the 20th of August. Kind courtesy, Baba. Congratulations in advance, my very good virgin. God will bless your new home. Marriage is a good thing. Whoever finds it, finds a good thing. A wife is a good thing, and whoever finds a wife finds a good thing. Bless the Lord, Baba. A very good morning to Inspector Haruna Majid. A good brethren to Inspector Haruna Majid Al Haji Majid. Good morning, I pick up your signal too. He's with the Ghana Police Service. He's actually with the SWAT team. He's one of the leaders of the SWAT team. They go for special operations like that. Inspector Majid, yes, bless the love and big up the entire Sakafa family. Big up Shehu Nuridin Raj. And the entire fraternity, the entire Sakafa fraternity, bless the love. Time to tell you the story of Yuna Mason. Yuna Mason, born Jamaican. Jamaicans are a people of high inspiration. I pick a lot of inspiration from Jamaicans. Jamaica is a very small island. If you hear Jamaica, 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 and how popular their patois language is, you think Jamaica is a very big land. It's a very small island, very small island. But the kind of mark the people of Jamaica are making as small as they are, you'll be shocked, my brother. Sometimes you might think the geographical, you know, size, the size of Jamaica is big. You might think Jamaicans are a large group. <laughs> They're a minority. They are very small. It's a very small island. 
by the impact they are making on the world with music and athletics. Predominantly, they are into music, farming, and sports. They don't play too much soccer. They're not, they play so much soccer anyway, but they don't make it professionally so well. Bob Marley played soccer. Peter Touch played soccer. Bernie Spear played soccer. All their stars played soccer for fun. But they don't make too much noise with, I mean, they don't make too much noise or they don't make too much mark. They don't make marks with soccer like they do with athletics. You know Usain Bolt and quite a number of athletes who have made Jamaica proud, put Jamaica on the global map. They use music to sell Jamaica. Jamaicans are so popular. I don't know where you enter and mention Jamaica and they will say, I don't know Jamaica. I don't know where you enter and mention Jamaica and they will tell you, I've never heard of Jamaica before. There are countries you hear and people will tell you, but not Jamaica. Everywhere you enter, you mention Jamaica, people will say, yes, I've heard that name before. But they are very, very, very small people. A very small island. The moral lesson is simple. It doesn't matter how small you are. It doesn't matter how deprived the area you come from. It doesn't matter how deprived the family you come from. You can still make a mark like Jamaica. You can be coming out of the slums of Ifiokuma, the slums of Kwesimintim, the slums of Sekendi, the slums of Adiambra, the slums of Nkotompo, the slums of Bak. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. Listen, you can still make a mark like Jamaica is making marks. This woman I'm talking about is from Jamaica. And the very first ever black person to work in BBC is this woman and it's from Jamaica. They keep breaking records. They keep breaking records upon records, even as small as they are. Don't belittle yourself. Is that what they say? Don't belittle yourself. Allow others to do the belittling, but you never belittle yourself. Never look down upon yourself. Never underrate what you can do. Dream it first. Imagine it. And once you achieve, you can imagine it or dream it, you can achieve it. She was born Yuna Maud Victoria Marson. Yuna Maud Victoria Marson, born on the 6th of February 1905. She was born on the 6th of February 1905. She died on the 6th of May 1965. Yuna Maud Victoria Marson. She was a Jamaican feminist. Listen, man. Anytime I talk about feminists like this, I don't want you to think about feminists of today. There are two different kinds of feminists. The feminists of yesterday are not the feminists of today. The feminists of today are in a war with the men of today. They are, they are a different breed of feminists. These are not the kind of feminists I'm talking about. The gifty anti kind of feminists, they are not the kind of feminists I'm talking about. When I talk about feminists like this, these were feminists who stood against systems. They stood against government fuckery. They stood against white supremacy. They did not leave the fight for men alone to do. They supported men to fight. They were not fighting men, but they supported men to fight wrong systems. Today's feminists, they see the system going wrong, they don't care. Their concern is to fight men. Men, they are in a competition with men. Raging anger towards men. They just, you know, man, they feel some way, somehow... Men are their problems. They are not the kind of feminists I'm talking about. I'm talking about the likes of this woman. Yuna Maud, Mer Maud Victoria Merson. She was a feminist. And I will tell you, the kind of feminism, the type of feminism she actually engaged in. She was an activist. She was a writer. She was a producer of poems. She was a producer of plays. She was a radio programmer. Uh, she was a radio programmer. Yuna Maud Victoria Merson, born on the 6th of February 1905. 
Mm-hmm. Now she traveled to London in 1932 and became the first black woman to be employed by the BBC during World War II. She became the first black woman to be employed by the BBC during the World War II. And I told you, in my rise with the sun motivation, me, I support what is happening in Niger. What happened in Mali, I support it. I am not supporting cool per se, but you see, what inspired the cool is what I'm tapping into. The French and the British have taken their colonies or their former colonies for granted for far too long. The, the nonsense royalties we pay to these people, the kind of pressure, diplomatic pressure upon we from these people, only our leaders know. When your president goes to grant interview to the international media, and they ask him about gayism, they ask him about homosexuality, and he can't give a straight answer. He's under pressure. But he can't because he's under some form of diplomatic pressure. They use loans and grants to suppress us. Till date, we still pay royalties to them when they are supposed to pay royalties to us. You must owe allegiance to them by hook or crook. So these French people, they are no nonsense people. You see what is happening in Ghana and Ghana is cool. Half of it will not happen in the French country. They will not take it. French people are a hyper people. They take no nonsense. So what is happening in Niger, Mali and all of those places are a reflex action. They are tired of the fuckery. They can't take it no more. They are tired of the pressure coming from the French or France. They can't take it no more. And they found a means to actually address the problem. And unfortunately, it is cool. So if we sit in Ghana and we say we don't care. I hear the Nigerian president talking here. If we sit in our comfort zones and we say we don't care. It is happening in Niger. and Yasema. When we are under the same pressure, they are under, they are resisting, we are under the same pressure. They are seeking support from Russia to help them, you know, let loose. Russia will never enslave, they will never put too much pressure upon you like that. They are so liberal with their relationship with you. They allow an open relationship. But these people want to enslave you in a modern style and fashion. Now they are seeking support from Russia to help them liberate themselves. The neo-colonialism, they want to get liberation from that kind of colonialism and they are seeking support from Russia. And Russia is, is, no, is not in good terms with these people, the West. So that's where if care is not taken, Africa will be turned into a war zone for them to settle their scores because Russia has issues with America, they have issues with France, they have issues with all of these people who are operating NATO. And ECOWAS is blindly reacting to the issue. ECOWAS is blindly acting to the... Re- the reaction of ECOWAS is poor, lacks wisdom, does not make sense at all. Now ECOWAS has given these international communities the green light to actually intervene. And when they are intervening, they are intervening with aggression. And this would tear Africa down into pieces. They will bring their war machines. They will come and test all their new productions here on the African soil. By the time they leave, total devastation. So people see a World War III, but Yuna Morrison was operating or she was employed by BBC during the World War II. In 1942, she became the producer of the program Calling the West Indies turning into Caribbean voices. When she picked up the program, the program was called Calling the West Indians. She turned it into Caribbean voices, which became an important forum of Caribbean, I mean, an important forum for Caribbean literacy work or Caribbean literary work. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about Yuna Maud Victoria Marson. Her biographer describes her in the life of Una, Una Morrison, 
which was actually released or written sometime in 1905, and it was released sometime in 1965. You know? Her biographer describes her as the first black British feminist to speak against racism and sexism in Britain. As the first black feminist to speak out against racism and sexism in Britain. These were the kind of feminists we're talking about. They team up with men to fight the system. They don't fight men. They team, out with, they team up with men. They were teaming up with the likes of Marcus Gavi. They teamed up with the likes of Malcolm X. They would team up with these people to fight societal menace, to fight white supremacy, oppression. They were not up in arms against no, no man. For a woman to speak out against racism and sexism in Britain at that time was rare. She made that mark. British civil rights leader, Billy, credited Yuna Marson with educating him on political and racial issues. Now, let me tell you about her early life. She was born on the 6th of February, 1905. She was born at Sharon Mission House, Sharon Village, near Santa Cruz, Jamaica, Santa Cruz, Jamaica, in somewhere around the parish of St. Elizabeth, parish St. Elizabeth. As the youngest of six children of Reverend Solomon Isaac Mason, who lived between 1858 and 1916, a Baptist person, and his wife, Ada Wilhelmina, you know, who lived between 1863 and 1922. She had a middle class upbringing, a middle class upbringing, not poor, not rich, a middle class upbringing. And was very close to her father. She was very close to her father. Who influenced some of her father-like characters in her later works. Her poems and writings, you feel the father-like characters in them. As a child before going to school, Merson was an, uh, one, was an avid reader of every available literature. Which at the time was mostly English classic literature. She would read almost everything readable that has to do with literature. Mostly English classical literature. At the age of 10, she was enrolled in Hampton High School, a girls' boarding school in Jamaica, of which her father was on the board of trustees. However, sadly enough, that same year, Reverend Isaac, her father, died, leaving the family with financial problems. Life is slippery. Don't mock people when they are in trouble. Life is slippery. One fat big road and very slippery with so much rocks and rocky, 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 rocky character like that. Life is slippery. We've seen poppers tend to kings and we've seen kings tend to poppers. We've seen the richest tend to the poorest. We've seen the poorest tend to the richest. Life is slippery. She got a middle class upbringing, not poor, nor rich, but later would decline into the poverty lane because she lost her father along the way. Her father was a board, was a member of the board of trustees. Her father was on the board of trustees of the school she attended. Can you imagine the prestige, the honor, if your father is a member of the board of trustees of the school you attend? Now, Papa is PTA chairman, Krampa, If your father is a PTA chairman or a PTA executive, Unam Kra, who feel the same? Now, Papa is a member of the board of trustees of the school you attend. But when this Ahinina and Che, the man died. Sending them back into poverty, sending them into poverty, they, they got confronted by financial problems, serious financial problems. So they moved to Kingston, Jamaica. She finished school at the Hampton High School, but did not go on to a college education because they had no money. After leaving Hampton, she found work in Kingston as a volunteer social worker and used the secretarial skills she obtained from school, you know, such as stenography. Uh, she had learned that in school. Her first job being with the Salvation Army. Salvation Army. In 1962, Marson was appointed assistant editor of the Jamaica political of the Jamaican political journal Jamaica Critic. Jamaica Critic. Her years there 
taught her journalism skills as well as influencing her political and social opinions and inspired her to create her own publication. In fact, in 1928, she became Jamaica's first female editor and publisher of her own magazine. The Cosmopolitan. The Cosmopolitan featured articles on feminist topics, local social issues, and workers' rights, and was aimed at a young, middle class Jamaican audience. Marson's articles encouraged women to join the workforce and to become politically active. The magazine also featured Jamaican poetry and literature from Marson's fellow members of the Jamaican Poetry League, started by J.E. Clare. J. E. Clare. In 1930, Marson published her first collection of poems entitled Tropic Reveries. Tropic Reveries that dealt with love and nature with elements of feminism. It won the medal. It won a medal, you know, uh, the, the Musgrave Medal from the Institute of Jamaica. Her poems about love are somewhat misunderstood by friends and critics as there is no evidence of a romantic relationship in Marson's life herself. Although love continued to be a common topic in her work, herself, you will not trace a romantic relationship in her life. In 1931, due to financial difficulties, the, Cosmo the Cosmopolitan ceased publication. Listen, at a point in time, eh? Every person, every great person at a point in time, it be here. It's not smooth through, it's not smooth all time. At a point in time, we be here. So she's one of them. At a point in time, look at the record she set. But at a point in time, she got confronted by financial difficulties series of times. When her father died, she got confronted by financial difficulties. When she picked up herself and then find somewhere to fix herself as a, as a social worker, she picked up herself and she, she was financially okay. Later again, at a point in time as a worker, she got confronted by a financial situation again that ran down her publication. The Cosmopolitan went down. The Cosmopolitan ceased publication, which led to her to begin publishing more poetry and plays because her magazine had collapsed. In 1931, she wrote her first play, At What a Price, about a Jamaican girl who moved from the, countries, from the country into the city of Kingston to work as a stenographer and falls in love with her white male boss. The play opened in Jamaica and later landed in, to a critical acclaim. In 1932, she decided to go to London to find a broader audience for her work and to experience life outside Jamaica. When she first arrived in the UK in 1932, Marson found the color bar restricted her ability to find work. She found the color bar restricted her ability to find work because, yo man, if you're black, there are certain jobs you will not get, you will not do. You will not even get them to do. So this color bar restricted her ability to work when she got to the UK. And she campaigned against that particular philosophy, that color bar. It is known as apartheid in South Africa. She stayed in, in Peckham, Southeast London, at the home of Harold Moody who the year before had founded civil rights organization, the League of Colored Peoples. The League sponsored a production of Mercy's play at what, point, at what a price in London in the winter of 1932 to 1933. First stage in Kingston, Jamaica in 1932. This four-act drama explores the experience of Ruth Mat Maitland a young woman who lives behind her family home in the countryside and moves to Kingston to become a stenographer in the office of a white English boss, I mean businessman. Uh, he pursues her relentlessly and Ruth becomes pregnant. She turns to the family home where a long-time 
Admara proposes marriage. The play explores woman's desires to the desires for love and for a career, as well as I mean um, interracial relations, sexual harassment in the workplace, and women's friendship. This particular play got him a critical acclaim. Shot him in, shot her, sh- shot her into limelight. I beg your pardon, not him, her into limelight. From 1932 to 1945, Mason moved back and fought between London and Jamaica. She continued to contribute to politics, but now instead of focusing on writing for magazines, she wrote for newspapers and her own literary works in order to get her political ideas across. In these years, Mason kept writing to advocate feminism. But one of the new emphasis was on the race issues in England. The race issues in England. Listen, man. The racism and sexism she found in the UK transformed both her life and her poetry. The voice in her poetry became more focused on the identity of black women in England. What happens to you is supposed to be an inspiration. Men ha hai, men fan in their way, hopey. whatever happens to you is supposed to be a source of inspiration. It's guiding you towards a particular direction. Nothing happens in your life for no reason. Pick inspiration from everything. I write more when I have when I have problems, when I have troubles, when I have serious difficulties or confrontations from life. There's a rush within the ink of my pen. I write a lot. That's where I want to pen down almost every happening. I want to write down almost every occurrence. I want to write everything. We keep on telling you when we decide to drop a book, you'll be shocked. You, you'll be shocked what you will read out of the book. Because we don't look some of the things we rise through. We don't look some of the truths we are walking through. You see us, you hear us on radio, and all you see is everything all right when we decide to drop books upon books you'll be shocked and like this woman she wrote more when she got confronted by life challenges that's how i do it. i write a lot i talk less and i intend to write a lot you want to jot everything so once you go to uk london and got confronted by some of these life struggling life difficulties her writing skills improved because she wrote almost everything. She wanted to put everything into writing. She returned to Jamaica in 1963. Lord God have mercy. But before she returned to Jamaica, outside of her writing at that, at that time, Merson was in the London branch of the International Alliance of Women, a global feminist organization. By 1935, she was involved with the International Alliance of Women based in Istanbul. She returned to Jamaica in 1936, where one of her goals was to promote national literature. National literature. Who am I talking about? You know, Mercy. Quite lengthy. I just checked my time. It's two minutes after eight. Listen, I would have to find some time. Add a little bit of time to this particular segment because almost every time somebody just sent me a text message telling me last week you said we were going to continue with the story last week about the economic history of Ghana. And the person took note of it. He's reminding me I should have continued that one. But production malice, I for, I've, I'm in production pressure. I forgot about the fact that I needed to continue and I brought a new, you know, profile. But don't worry. I'll go back to it and do it. I'll run it. Don't worry. You know, I'll run it. Today, I am running out of time too. And it looks as if I just have to summarize the story of this great woman. You know, um, this great woman who became the first, you know, to work with the BBC, the first female black, I mean, the fem- first female black to work with the BBC. You know, um, she has a lot of works. Details of Mason's life are limited. You know, her personal life, details of her personal lives are limited. And those, you know, pertaining to her personal and professional life uh, post-1945 are particularly elusive. About herself, not too much is known, limited like that, but her professional life, very, you know, elusive. In 1945, she published a poetry collection entitled Towards the Stars. 
This marked a shift in the focus of her poetry. While she once wrote about female sadness over lost love, poems from towards the stars were much more focused on the independent woman. You know, her effort outside of her writing seemed to work in collaboration with these sentiments, though conflicting stories of offer. I mean, conflicting stories offer little um, concrete evidence about what she exactly did. Because she wrote about stories that are conflicting, that confused a lot of people. They did not really, you know, get it. Whether she was writing about herself or about other people. Sometimes you feel like she was writing about herself with different characters or names. Sometimes you look at her life and you feel like, no, no, it looks like she's not writing about herself because she's not so much into this love thing. She has no trace of romantic relationship. So what she's writing might not be her, or it might be her. She confused people with her poem, her themes. So very little is known about her personal life, but quite a lot is known about her professional life, her time with the BBC, and her poetic works. She was a legend. She flew the flag of Jamaica high. She gave honor to black people. She gave honor to black women by breaking a record and becoming the first ever. Listen, whether we like it or not, BBC propaganda, whether we like it or yes, we have our issues with the international media, but the point remains that they are the standard. They are the pioneers of this particular trade we are actually plying. We look up to them. They are the footprints. They have the upper hand. Listen, man. BBC is BBC. Komla Dumo is Komla Dumo. World class Komla Dumo because of BBC. We won't deny it. When we have the opportunity to serve her the BBC, we will say probably we we'll go down there to want to change the narrative. How they portray Africa, how they run down Africa sometimes, the propaganda, the fake news style. We have problems with that. But the point remains the same. BBC is BBC. So for somebody like her from the slums of Jamaica to walk in there as the first ever black woman, that record is huge and she is a legend. Mm -hmm.